application credit, the sign-in sheet, uh, the front table. Uh, we also have a copy of Orlando's most recent book. Um, I'd be happy to raffle that off if anyone's interested. You should, uh, give us your business card and uh, we'll pick one. And uh, the one we choose, we'll get a copy of the book. Again, the CLE sign-in sheets at the front. Uh, this qualifies for two credits. Thank you.
But based on U.S. law, anything that hasn't been paid is considered confiscation. And, and, and it's a violation of international law, and of course it's a violation of U.S. law as well. Expropriation. Uh, if Cuba uses nationalization and expropriation, expropriation uh, is, is basically when you are ta it's a taking that is not in, in, in based on any uh, uh, country specific or, or, or anything that is uh, more nationalization, which is the Mexican oil uh, 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 nationalization process. So basically, you will see in some different uh, uh, statutes and, 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 and regulation the use of the three of them. Uh, but in reality, uh, in Cuba, we see confiscation, we see expropriation, and they call forced expropriation and nationalization. Uh, and we're going to go there when we see the different uh, laws that they passed to, to, to accomplish all these uh, three processes. Um, then we're going to talk about U.S. certified claims. Uh, we're going to see if it really uh, a claimant uh, owns a property in Cuba today. Uh, or basically, they only have the right of compensation. Um, uh, some people think that they still uh, there is U.S. property in Cuba. The answer is no. Uh, probably at the beginning of all this uh, process, uh, there was an, uh, the, the, the whole idea was just to get back uh, uh, over from the government and, and, and get the property back the same way that it was before. Uh, it's not quite right. Uh, there's no U.S. Uh, property in Cuba today, but there is an obligation to pay for to take it. Uh, and, and, and then uh, I think that's that's very important. Uh, then we have uh, another principle uh, which is important: the act of the state of training uh, protection. Uh, uh, some people think that Sabatino case is still is active and is, is, is really the way to go and, and, and basically the a, a, a court in, in the U.S. doesn't have the, uh, the right to uh, um, uh, adjudicate or make a, a determination based on the taking uh, by the Cuban government. Uh, so some people are misleading that Sabatino is still is, is in place and, and the answer is not. Uh, the second Hicken-Looper amendment basically uh, took care of this. And basically, it says that yes, the U.S. court can still uh, 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 consider a case that has been a, in, in, a, in a taking that has been in violation of international law. Which is, uh, so basically, uh, uh, all the different cases that we, uh, we saw before, uh, I mean, after uh, the amendment, uh, were uh, considered and, 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 and also the act of the doctrine uh, was going a little uh, different uh, place right now but when we uh, talk about the full judgment all of the judgments against the Cuban government uh, we had a specific assertion that said that the act of the doctrine doesn't apply to those cases uh, also keep in mind that for the second Hicken Looper uh, to be applied is only for U.S. national, U.S. citizen at the time of expropriation, no Cuban national. That's very important because international law deals with the citizens and, uh, of two different countries. So you cannot use international law to uh, the cases of the Cuban national. So that's important to keep in mind. So talking about Cuban national, uh, you know, the, 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 the health court, I don't want to get into that, but the health court uh, uh, considered also the Cuban national, uh, uh, which is, again, is not really, uh, the, the U.S. government cannot or shouldn't espouse or, or cannot espouse any claim of, of a national for another country in any, in any uh, settlement or negotiation. Um, so, so what are the options for the Cuban national? Well, we know that there are some legal that we're going to go over, there are some political, and also there are social aspects, especially on, 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 the, uh, on the residences, the, the, the primary houses that were uh, uh, confiscated. Um, so we're going to also talk a little bit about how Cuba 
uh, responded or has responded to all these uh, 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 claims, uh, laws, and, 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 and it, it really, uh, uh, the Cuban has a, a legitimate claim. Uh, they don't want to call it counterclaim, uh, but there is a claim uh, for damages on the embargo. Uh, we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, is that based on international law? Is it just pure Cuban law? Or just, just, uh, just to put something on the table to get uh, a, a fair uh, uh, settlement. Um, then we're going to go, of course, and talk about settlement. Uh, we're going to go government to government. We're going to talk about spousal doctrine. Uh, basically, the U.S. president has an obligation to uh, represent the claims of his citizen. Uh, and, and it has to be on a government to government, uh, whatever the U.S. President and uh, through the Secretary of State uh, settle, uh, that will be final and that will be uh, not trigger uh, a fifth uh, amendment taken. Uh, uh, some people think that, okay, I mean, if you settle for 10 cents uh, a dollar, uh, I, I won't be able to, I mean, I, 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 I'm going to sue the government because uh, uh, the settlement is not fair and I've been waiting for 60 or whatever years and, 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 and that may be considered taking because the answer is not. Uh, whatever the, the president negotiates uh, in, in the, between the countries and the government, the government that will be fine. Um, so we're going to talk about later about what I call the self-help, direct negotiation. Uh, what opportunities may be for some claimants. Uh, we're going to talk about a specific case, uh, Shanghai Power Electric, which basically is a case in work. Uh, it was in the Chinese uh, uh, program, uh, uh, claims program, uh, when there was a Chinese Shanghai Electric had a claim for about 125 million, and the government to government negotiation that uh, uh, was set up for 20 million, which is, 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 is fine. No, about 25 million, but it, uh, it was kind of fine. But the uh, uh, representative of Shanghai complained, and, and they uh, went to the court and they tell Judge, uh, this is not fair. Uh, uh, I, I disagree, and I wish you would be entitled to receive the 125 million that was uh, certified by the Foreign Claims uh, Commission. Uh, so the judge said, Well, what have you done? Have you been to China? Have you negotiated? Have you tried to get a deal over there? So well, I, I, probably we don't know, but we can go there and negotiate. We say, well, you should. Actually, you have an obligation to go there and negotiate the best possible outcome of your claim. You cannot rely on the government to, 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 to do it for you. So basically, it was dismissed, and then that was the end. And that's a, an important uh, case for considering the self-help uh, negotiation. Um, okay, let's go back to Cuba now. Cuban constitutional laws related to expropriation. We have the 1940 constitution that in the Article 44 prohibited confiscation. Uh, basically, they considered takings, justified cause of public utility, social and national interest, declared by competent judicial authority with compensation. Uh, it's not the government to say, okay, I'm going to take your property and, and, and I'll see you later. Or, or just as uh, was mentioned before, you know, it's the, the Council of Ministers uh, in Cuba, the same uh, entity that gives you the authorization to do business in Cuba has the right to, to do the taking. Uh, and you don't have any right to go to a, a, a court and, 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 and complain and try to, to get a fair amount uh, or adequate compensation. Um, so basically, that was 1940 constitution. So what really happened is that uh, going back to the 1940 constitution, keep in mind that Batista, uh, uh, in 1952, uh, uh, coup, uh, he eliminated all of the 1940 constitution. So 19, in, in 1959, really the 1940 constitution was kind of dormant, uh, and, 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 and Batista was really. Uh, 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 out of the uh, of inconstitutional uh, uh, framework. Uh, so what happened is, in, 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 in just the beginning of 1959, the uh, uh, Cuban revolutionary government uh, has a fundamental uh, law of 1959, which uh, uh, 
uh, they needed to modify this particular article to permit or to allow the confiscation uh, in three uh, important uh, uh, situations. Uh, one, if the individual was involved with the Batista regime, uh, the individual committed a counter-revolutionary crime, and the individual left the country uh, uh, permanently, uh, basically to avoid justice. Um, uh, there was three of them, and that was the first confiscation that we saw during uh, 1959. Uh, there was an appeal process. This was an appeal process. There was a tribunal of accounts, the uh, de Cuentas, uh, and, and there was a final appeal uh, before the Ministry of the Treasury, the Ministry of the Treasury, I translated it like that, it's the uh, Hacienda, which basically they created uh, the, 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 all the, the, the confiscated property uh, were uh, handled and managed by, by the Ministry. Um, the, this fundamental law was, oh, they, they did a few other uh, changes to the fundamental law, uh, because uh, they, they wanted to make sure that uh, the, the, they can go through what, I call, what they call the forced expropriation. So basically, uh, uh, the, all the cases on expropriation, and, and this is quite interesting, uh, the, the cases uh, were handled by the Ministry of uh, uh, the Treasury, Hacienda, and, and, and that uh, ministry uh, changed some function to the FUSE plan, uh, the, planning uh, entity, <clears throat> and then ended up being uh, handled uh, in, in 1963 uh, by law of 1158 to the Cuban Ministry of Justice. And the Cuban Ministry of Justice also uh, has uh, the Cuban registry um, uh, property on the Cuban Ministry of Justice. So if you want to, and this is important, if, if you want to do business in Cuba today, you want to try to invest in a property in Cuba, uh, part of the due diligence is just to make sure that the property was not confiscated, or if it was expropriated, you want to see who was the prior owner, and see if it makes any sense to get a deal out of that, to make sure that you are not violating U.S. law, that you are not trafficking with confiscated <laughs> property, and you then, so you go to the Ministry of Justice, uh, and, and, and then you go to the uh, property registry, and, and you get either a copy of the, the confiscatory decree, or you get just basically uh, a, a, a certificate that it says that the property has been transferred to the state uh, from prior owner. So basically, uh, all those cases are still in suspense somewhere in the Ministry of Justice. Then we go to the uh, 1976 uh, Constitution, as amended in 1992, uh, which authorizes appropriation and confiscation. You got both of them, and but, but they were want to make sure that they differentiate uh, one to the other. Uh, they uh, said that expropriation of property for reason of public benefit or social interest with due compensation. Uh, uh, today is a little different. Today they talk about needs of the expropriated uh, and, and and even the, the foreign investment legislation is a little different than the, the, the constitution. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and they also, of course, consider that confiscation is, is just a sanction in case that there is a violation of the law. And, and, and some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, some important cases in Cuba, you know, Cora Capital, Masmarangio, and the name that those are really uh, individuals that were not really expropriated. Those people uh, were, in a certain way, accused or, or were being sanctioned in, in violation of the criminal law, and they apply the confiscation to those uh, properties. Okay, uh, we got agrarian reforms, uh, 1959, I think that was the first one. Uh, it, it was a uh, reading in the, in the Sierra Maestra, uh, and it was uh, in May uh, 17, 1959. Uh, they passed the first uh, agrarian reform, which Pretty much it was in line with what is, was happening in the war, especially in Latin America at that time. Um, so basically, that particular law uh, included a compensation, and it was uh, through a 20 year bond uh, for a half percent. Uh, corporate bonds back then it was a 3.9, so this one it was kind of attractive in terms of, of, the, of the, the, 
the payment, the kilo, or you name it. Uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the question here is this, uh, would they really pay? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, they said that the, the by law of 576, uh, you are issued the first emission of, of, of agrarian bonds. Uh, probably you can still see in some of those old bonds uh, uh, trading some, some, some places. I remember years ago, uh, uh, someone in, in, in London told me that there were some still government bonds, uh, defaulted government bonds uh, that are that, that, it's a violation of US law. You cannot uh, deal and trade with the uh, Cuban bonds. So, uh, so I don't know. Um, there was a second one, and, and, and established a payment uh, uh, of uh, kind of interesting payment. Uh, here, it, it is important uh, because uh, yeah, we're going to talk about valuation and we're going to talk about value of the land. You know, what's the difference between what the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission estimated as the value of the land in Cuba in 1959 and 1960 uh, compared to Cuba. Uh, but basically, we had a quite substantial difference. Uh, they, they think that probably agricultural land, especially for sure, came with probably about uh, maybe 2,000, a little less than 2,000 uh, dollar. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, let me see, I, I do it right, the, the hectares, right? Hectares? Probably? Caballeria 2000? No, I, I think well, I, I have the notes on price. Well, but anyhow, what? Well, the, the, the best place to go is to go to the United Food Claim Accepted, and there you see how land is valued. Right, sugar cane. And we're going to talk about that. So, but the, the, the valuation here it was a little more uh, different. And we're talking about around 5,000 uh, uh Sorry, I don't remember now. Hector, or acres. No, I it's it's Cavalleria, I think. Uh, different Cavalleria is, uh, is, of course, one, one Cavalleria is, is uh, uh, 15 uh, hectares, and one Cavalleria is 33 hectares. So it's a big difference. So we have to be careful. But anyhow, that, that, there is a different evaluation that, that is important to, to think about. The Cuban National Bank was responsible for payments. Uh, in 1973, you officially finalized uh, the indemnification process. I don't know how many people received those payments. Then, um, then uh, we're going to talk about how they apply to U.S. Uh, different than Cuban national and, 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 and citizen of other uh, uh, countries. Uh, Law 851 of 1960 nationalized all the properties of U.S. national, uh, providing a payment of 2% uh, interest to be financed for the profits of Cuba realized from, from sales of sugar in the U.S. market in excess of 3 million tons. Uh, there was a sugar quota, I mean, uh, 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 that is, uh, I want to talk too much about that, but, but it was very important for Cuba. Cuba has a preference in, in the U.S. market. Uh, and, and, and the reason of the sugar quota is not because of uh, the U.S. interest in Cuba, is because the Cuba helped uh, U.S. during difficult times, and, 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 and in return of those uh, uh, help, uh, Cuba received a very a, 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 a preferable treatment uh, in terms of the sugar price and sugar quota. Um, we're going to talk about why this is all about. We're going to talk about historical. We'll see if this one makes sense or not. The U.S. said, okay, well, how can you say that you're going to have a payment uh, uh, structure when there's no sure quota anymore? Uh, you know, and, and it, they said that it was uh, illusory. I mean, it's not feasible. There was no sure quota back, back uh, during those, uh, it, it was already canceled or was uh, uh, suspended. Um, so basically the structure of this particular, and it takes, uh, the, we have to think about today, you know, if there would be a kind of an agreement, a settlement, what would be the source if there would be a payment plan? Uh, we know that the Rick uh, Crawford and I think uh, uh, Cubello mentioned, okay, let's put a 2% or 
whatever on, 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 on export sales, I must walk by right. I think it's illegal, by the way, uh, uh, to put a, 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 a duty on export. Uh, but, but there are other formulas, and we can talk about that. Um, uh, Cuban's Law 80 of 1996 basically says that they recognize the, the right of compensation. But also they said that they don't want to negotiate on their uh, 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 force or whatever, or, and, 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 that, uh, it, and they have to consider the Cuban claims in that potential negotiation. Uh, so we didn't know back then what was actual the embargo damages. So in 2000, the, the Cuban uh, court uh, uh, estimated that the damages for embargo was about 121 billion, and today that number probably we are about 150, 170 billion. Uh, keep in mind, it was uh, claims was 1.9 billion, uh, with interest of today is we're talking about 8 billion. So you had a U.S. property claim for 8 billion, and then you had a contra claim or a claim from Cuba, they want to call it contra claim, uh, of uh, 120 billion. So it's a little difficult uh, to negotiate. Um, I don't want to get into that, uh, but keep in mind that what happened in 1950, 1960, uh, 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 there was an aggression, there was, there was a war, it was a civil war inside Cuba, and there was, uh, uh, there was some uh, issue with the U.S. Uh, they were uh, bombarding, they were uh, 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 burning uh, sugarcane fields, uh, uh, everything is happening, but at the same time, uh, the Cuban government was smart enough to negotiate a deal with the Soviet. So when we talk about the okay, the, the, the sugar quota or maybe the compensation issue, uh, the Cuban government was already had a deal with the Russians, with the Soviet, and, and, and the Soviet was willing to, to purchase all the sugar uh, that Cuba was uh, uh, willing to uh, export, and, and, and basically the Soviet. Uh, Cuba was able to negotiate a, a, a better deal. Uh, and, and it's funny because uh, uh, Fidel Castro was saying, okay, well, uh, you know, why you made a decision going with the Soviet? And for particular, there were a little different reason. But, but, but mainly, uh, he said, well, you cannot change the account of the government. You know, it's a, I mean, the, the, the U.S. has put a lot of uh, uh, pressure and, 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 and they're gonna pay you this and, and the Soviet uh, is the, is the cow. I mean, they, they're gonna give me uh, 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 subsidized oil and uh, purchase the, 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 the sugar and, 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 and that was the deal. Um, so so basically, when, when you see all these chronology uh, events, that includes, of course, the first expropriation was the United Fruit. Um, uh, a couple of reasons for United Fruit. Uh, United Fruit uh, was involved, according to the Cuban government, was involved in, in Guatemala for the coup. And, 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 and basically, uh, uh, well, they said, well, this, this is one of those companies that really going to have an interest in, 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 in uh, act against the revolution. Uh, but at the same time, there is a little more uh, uh, historical perspective. Uh, Fidel Castro's uh, uh, father, uh, was uh, 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 Mary, uh, the daughter of the manager of United Fruit, and Fidel Castro is uh, is uh, is uh, the son uh, 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 the son of, of the main uh, and in an extra marital relations. So far, no, United Fruit was just a coincidence, but it's a combination of both. Uh, there is a little hate or hate, I don't know. <laughs> between Fidel Castro and United Fruit quite for some time. Uh, so United Fruit is, is actually, it's funny, United Fruit today is not a U.S. company. It's a, it's a Brazilian company. So that's another interesting part of it, to see this and what is going to be happen, if any, happen with United Fruit future in Cuba one day, Chiquita. It's no longer United Fruit. Um, so, uh, I don't want to spend some time on this, but I think it's important to take a look. Uh, on Cuban nationals, a, a law A90 uh, basically uh, uh, is procured uh, all the main uh, businesses in Cuba, owned by Cuban nationals and also by other foreigners. Uh, 
one of the, 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 the disputes was, uh, you know, this, this, uh, the, the U.S. expropriation was discriminatory. That's another violation of international law. You cannot expropriate a group of people because of religion or country or you name it. So basically, the U.S. said, no, 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 no. We also can to expropriate humans and other countries. This is not discriminatory. What? Okay. But the first group was uh, U.S. Uh, property. Um, then you have the, uh, the, the House of the Reform uh, Law, the group of uh, Reform uh, Law, that basically uh, eliminated all the rental uh, in Cuba, and all the people that were renting uh, became, uh, uh, sometimes it was not the owners, uh, had a process to, to actually get title later on, and, and basically instead of paying the rent to uh, the, the the owner of the property uh, paid uh, subsidized rent to the state, and the state basically got the ownership of the property uh, to the different agencies, and, and then that uh, person, after paying rent to the state for quite some time, uh, they got uh, uh, they, 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 they were considered uh, they have purchased the, the, the property and, and get title. Uh, so today we have uh, a huge amount of uh, residents owned by the Vivos in Cuba, and, and I would say, I don't know, probably 90%, 80%, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a huge uh, percentage of uh, those individuals have title. Uh, Cuba has a, 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 a law, which is called Usucapio, uh, in, in English, it's a common uh, it's, it's law, it's a first uh, possession. After you are living in a property for quite some time, uh, if you have, uh, you know, uh, 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 open possession and, and free possession and you never know the property and then you have a good title, you are, are, are considered a property dealer and, and you are going to have uh, adverse possession and you're going to get a clear title. Um, uh, law 19, uh, 989 of 1961, uh, everybody uh, was, uh, uh, this, is, this is confiscation. Uh, basically, anybody that left the country for different, it depends on the country that you were uh, going, uh, U.S. I think it was a week or two weeks or three weeks, and uh, Europe was a month and some other country three months. But basically, they consider that you abandoned the country, and that's why the state has uh, had the right to confiscate your property. That law was applied retroactively because there were some people that really they were not living already in Cuba, and, and they applied the law and confiscated properties. Uh, property means everything. Uh, then we have the final stage of expropriation. It was completed in 1968 when all the small businesses, today, uh, the Tapatistas, the Paladares, and the Breakers, were completely expropriated. Um, so that's. Uh, so we already mentioned the U.S. certification. Uh, we know that the Cuban Claims Act of 1964 amended the Foreign International Claims Act of 1949. Uh, the role of the Foreign Claims Act Commission was to uh, certify. Uh, determine the amount of validity of the claims against the government of Cuba, uh, doesn't provide payment for losses, there were no uh, frozen accounts, there was no fund, they would never create a fund, that's why some of those they never got any compensation on those because it was not created by that statute. <coughs> uh, basically what what the, the Foreign Claims Commission was doing is just to uh, provide like a free adjudication and present it to the Secretary of State so the Secretary of State can negotiate on a government to government uh, potential settlement with the Cuban government. Uh, evaluation Cuba had mentioned about 800 million. Uh, the Cuban 75 claim uh, was about uh, 1.9 billion. Um, uh, you got a five, we're gonna go a little over uh, those uh, claimants, uh, that is about uh, 5,913 uh, certified claimants out of 8,000 that uh, tried to get certification. Uh, uh, sort of those individuals that went, went, wasn't certified for different reasons, uh, not for profit, were not uh, certified. Um, uh, what are the principles and guidelines for certification process and negotiation on settlement? This is quite important. Uh, there is a principle that is called the nationality and continuous nationality of the claimant. Uh, this is a particular claim, you can take a look at this particular claim, explain a little bit about that. Um, 
Uh, basically, what, what, what happened here is this. According to the Cuban claim side and, and international claim sediment, uh, and to be considered certified, you have to be a U.S. citizen. And then, at the time of confiscation, uh, if it was an, a corporation, the nationality of the corporation was determined by the share, the citizenship of the shareholders. So all the majority of the company that we so uh, 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 certified were Cuban companies, were Cuban companies uh, registered in Cuba, but owned by U.S. corporations, where the majority of the shares were owned by U.S. citizens. Um, so that's the first determination. The second one is that that U.S. national, a U.S. citizen, a U.S. national, according to this one, has to maintain the claim until the day that is adjudicated. And, and, and we'll see here, and, and there are a couple of examples that are important to keep in mind. Some people have purchased some people have transferred those claims. There are some transactions, some of them are illegal or, 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 or prohibited, and, and, but at the end of the day, is if a non-US person owns a claim, that particular claim won't be espoused by the US government. It doesn't make any sense for the US government to settle a claim to a, for a foreigner. So that's important to keep in mind. People think that it's, oh, I got certified, that claim is good enough, I can purchase the claim, I can go with the claim, and I'm going to wait for the check from the, from the IRS or from the Treasury. No, that's not quite right. Uh, again, we're talking about 60-year process. We don't know how we're going to end it up doing this. So but keep that in mind, that's the principle. Um, there is another principle talking about speculation. It's called the anti-speculation clause. It was already in the Cuban Claims Act, and it was reaffirmed by the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission notice of 2008. Uh, Mauricio Tamargo was the commissioner back then, and he said, well, you know what, we have to stop. There were some lawyers, I don't want to talk about black lawyers, but there were some lawyers that then created and, and, and purchasing, or uh, recommending some investors uh, purchasing uh, uh, claims, and, and they had to stop. And they said, well, well, that's illegal. And illegal for two reasons. They also, uh, uh, the Department of the Treasury, uh, OFAC, uh, passed another notice and said, okay, to do any transaction related with Cuba, and Cuba has a, an interest, which the claims is, a, is an interest uh, for the Cuban government, uh, requires a license. And if you don't have a license and you do a transfer, that's, that's void. And void are, are an issue. So, so people that say, okay, I, I, I'm a used person, I purchased this claim, in 1985 or 1995 or 2016. Well, you know what? Did you get a license for an offer? No, I didn't get it. I don't need it. Oh, yeah, you better. So I don't know what's going to happen with them, but they are really in violation of the, of the regulation. Um, another principle is tax deduction. Uh, the, the, some people in Cuba think that uh, because uh, in, in, 19, um, in 1960, we were allowed to, to uh, uh, go and, and declare losses in Cuba, and, 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 and there was an amendment to the IRS code that allowed the, 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 the losses in Cuba, the takings in Cuba, to be considered casualty loss. So basically, you can uh, write off the, the, the losses for up to 20 years. So the, the, the U.S. national scheme, Cuban national, that uh, 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 came to the United States had the right to basically uh, deduct from, from, from profits up to for 20 years of the uh, takings. So the Cubans say, okay, well, if you already deducted, I mean, is the U U.S. government the owner of the claim? You know, the individual, you got already a benefit. Well, that's not quite right. The U.S. government doesn't own and doesn't really have any, any, any that if, if for, for whatever reason you had 10 million uh, lost and then you were able to write off complete it and if you receive a check well basically your base is zero whatever you receive you have to pay taxes as of today for whatever amount you receive but if you deducted 5 million and you receive a check for another 5 million really you don't have to pay taxes that's I make it simple a little more complicated but I'm trying to make it simple 
uh, you to understand basically the step. Uh, this is a list, uh, basically, what is important about this list? The 5,913 claimants, the first 20 or 19 uh, represent about uh, is it 1.2 billion, uh, only 19 claimants. Uh, some names are very familiar to you. Uh, there was one in particular that you, uh, if you're involved in the Cuban, uh, you know, Starwood. Starwood has SSM in Cuba. Uh, they got a, a management contract. The Starwood is today the uh, owner of the ITT Corporation. Uh, uh, that is a claim about 130 million uh, uh, with our interest. Uh, so, uh, what would be the interest for Starwood in Cuba? We don't know. Uh, they have uh, approached the Cuban government to settle this one. We don't know. What we know is that ITT was probably the only company, this is important, was the only company that really, in a certain way, enforced the Hans Borton to get paid compensation for trafficking, even before the enactment of the law. Because the Title III was always weight, but ITT went after a state, an Italian company in Cuba, that was, uh, uh, well, they had, I think, 27% of the Texa uh, shares, and, and, and basically said, well, you are trafficking. So the, 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 the U.S. government needed a case, needed this particular case to make it more relevant, the Title III and the Hanford against traffickers. And an ITT received $22 million for the use of the STEX STEX, uh, ITT's access in Cuba for 10 years. So probably, probably as far as I know, it's the only company that has been able to get that money for a foreigner doing business in Cuba uh, after uh, the revolution. Uh, then they use on small deals that we don't know. So this is and it's a public deal. And, and there is a case, an important case, because minority shareholders sue ITT trustee and say, oh, hold on one second. You got 22 million? What about us? Because ITT was, uh, uh, the Cuban telephone uh, company was on uh, 58% by ITT, but there was minority shareholders. They were all shareholders. So those shareholders sue ITT trustee and say, wait, wait a second. We, we need it. We want a piece of that too, 22 million. We don't know the result, it was privately handled and settled, so they got something out of that. Um, so uh, we need to keep an eye on, on Saudi. That would be an interesting uh, case. Uh, keep in mind that uh, <coughs> the same con, uh, uh, okay, the Cuban claims, they have two, two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, phases. Phase one was in 19, uh, from 1960. To 1972, that they completed the first uh, uh, certification process. The second one was open because Cuban government realized that they needed a piece of land close to the airport, and, and it, it belonged to a radio uh, company in Cuba. And when they went to the radio company, they realized that it was a U.S. company, it was owned by ITT. So they, they confiscated it, they expropriated it, and then they ITT was able to reopen the Cuban claim with uh, commission case, open the second one, and got a certification. So, uh, Starwood, if we think that they had a, 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 a property in Cuba, they really own a huge piece of property close to the Havana airport. And Cuba wants to build a hotel there. So, why not? Right? Okay. So they have to think about it. Um, Agreement on the U.S. Uh, uh, presidential constitutional executive. Basically, it's, it's, the steps are uh, you don't need Congress to be involved, Secretary of uh, State authorized negotiation. There are already three rounds of negotiations so far. Um, I don't know what if the Trump administration will, will do it. I, I, I think they have to make a decision pretty soon. Uh, it's every six months. Um, so, probably we're going to hear sometimes in the next few weeks of dates. Uh, they're going to have a fourth round of negotiation in between. Uh, they meet, they talk, they, I don't know how it's going to be, because they've been longer there. Uh, so we have new people in the, on the table.
table, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, once they get an agreement, as I mentioned before, it's final, they settle the claim, they present it to Congress, that's about it. Bye bye. Um, uh, final comments, uh, you certify that it shall not be resolved uh, without leaving the embargo. Why? Because it, it, one, of the, one of the reasons that people are still hesitating to do business, if we, even you as companies doing business, as we uh, 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 heard before, is because you don't want to be dealing with uh, this propriety company. You, you don't want to get into it. So basically, it is very important to be your time to let the people to invest, to get good title, to get the opportunity to own property and do business without the uh, uh, pressure, or, or maybe the, just you know, take the risk that you're going to be sued and you're going to be liable for, for expropriation or for trafficking in expropriated property. So I believe that it's important to do it. Otherwise, if you settle the claim and, and there's no U.S. interest in Cuba, then all the foreigners, Chinese or Russian, Brazilian, you name it, uh, will have a, a green light in business in Cuba, and, and there will be no really any negotiation allow the U.S. Uh, uh, company to participate in the future of Cuba. And at the same time, uh, it is important not to do it just a simple government to government settlement. I think you have to go a second step. You have to go back with the bilateral investment treaty. We have to have a rule. We have to have transparency in the process. Uh, if a U.S. company cannot go to Cuba and do business, especially a corporation or a large corporation, that's some obligation, corporate obligation, anti-monopoly, anti, uh, anti-corruption. Uh, anti uh, you know, it, it has to be supported by a legal framework that I call the Bilateral Investment Treaty that really support those investments and it's going to take care of future takings, how to handle, how to resolve it, and, and that's what I have to do. watching a White House press briefing. I, hope I, I make it uh, interesting and, and, and fun and informative for you. Um, in order to make, how many of you are Cuban born here? All right. How many of you have been back to Cuba? Okay, so you've seen the destruction and everything else. Okay, so. Right. so in order to convey the real information that I want to convey here, first I'm going to do a very dry, legal, CLE, analysis of Helms Burton, which will put half the audience to sleep. But in order to convey to all of my compatriotas the real meaning of Helms Burton, every now and then I will switch to a Cuban context. For example, if one of your kids wants to do something really, really stupid, what you tell them, if you're an American, is son or daughter, you might want to consider not doing what you think you're not doing, because it may not be in your best interest. If you're Cuban, you bring him in, you hold him by the ear, and you go, Chiquillo de porra, tu eres mentecato, como se te va a ocurrir hacer eso? So, when, when I switch to Cuban Spanish, you will understand the real meaning of Helms Burton, which is not easy to catch, by the way. The first thing I want to say about Helms Burton is, we need to understand the context in which it was enacted, and the purpose of the law. And, and to do that, first we need to go back a little bit and understand the framework for the U.S. embargo in Cuba. And the, the original framework began with the Trade with the Enemy Act, which is a law that dates back to 1917. And I always ask my students, what was going on in 1917? And most of them by now have no clue what was happening in 1917. Well, in 1917, the United States entered World War I. Not two, one. And the purpose of the Trade with the Enemy Act was to freeze the financial assets of 
Imperial German. Not Nazi Germany, Imperial German. So that's the underpinning of the Trading with the Enemy Act. That under the Trading with the Enemy Act, the President of the United States had broad authority to take action in order to freeze the financial assets of the enemies of the United States. And that is the vehicle that was used by the Kennedy administration back in the days of 1962 to go after Cuban financial assets. From there, we also had action under, under the Foreign Aid Act. We also, later on, much later on, enacted the Cuban Democracy Act, also known as Torricelli. And then we had the Cuban Liberty and Solidarity Act, known popularly as Hans Burton, to Cuban Americans as La Gelberto. And that one basically codified the embargo. And what used to be regulatory authority for the President of the United States became the law of the land, which is why it became extremely difficult for the Obama administration to really roll back the embargo completely, because it, it was basically enshrined in law. So what that administration would do was basically amend the regulations around the embargo. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The other, the, the key citation, if you're going to do a deep dive into the Cuban embargo, is 31 CFR 515.101. And, and C. Those are the regulations enacted by the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the U.S. Treasury, and they basically seek to define the contours of the embargo that are enacted in House of Work. There are also, I skipped uh, the citation to the Export Administration rules uh, enacted by the Department of Commerce, because that's really a little bit outside the scope. And of course, Florida being Florida, we also have Florida statutes having to do with the Cuban embargo, and I also will not bore you with those, but you might want to take a look if you are so inclined. So, how does the Helms Burton legislation get enacted? Cuban Americans will know it immediately. It was in the context of the shoot down to the Brothers to the Rescue aircraft in international waters by the Cuban Air Force. Four Cuban Americans were killed, and in reaction to that, the Clinton administration pushed forward the Helms Burton legislation, which had been stalled. Those of us who were involved even back then in the Cuba issue knew that at that time the Clinton administration had started an initiative to do basically what the Obama administration did, which is to recast, reset the relationship with Cuba. The shoot down to the brothers to the rescue aircraft and the killing of the four Cuban Americans in international waters basically brought that to a screeching halt and enabled the passing of this legislation on a fast track. The key point for us to remember in Helms Burton, and this, this is the basic linchpin of Helms Burton, is that it codified those regulations that I mentioned before, 31 CFR 515-101. But within that codification is the allowance to continue to modify those same regs. And, and that's an important point to remember, because what Helms Burton basically did is take a snapshot of the regs in 1996, and said, this is the law of the land, and it shall not be removed unless certain conditions are met. But the regulation of that continued because it was ingrained in the structure of the rights. It also prohibits, in a very straightforward way, the financing of transactions involving confiscated property subject to a claim by a U.S. national as of March 12, 1996. And that's an important provision to remember. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. I wanted to point something out about what Helms Burton is and what it is not. Helms Burton should not be looked at as a claims statute, although it has very definite claims, provisions, mechanisms, and procedures. Helms Burton, as Mark Twain used to say, there are two things that you should never see how they're made, which is sausages and laws. And Helms Burton is a sausage, and one I will define. And at the end of the day, it attempts to do a number of things. The first thing it attempts to do is a political response to an outrageous act by the Cuban government. That's the first thing it does, and you'll see it in the findings. The second thing it seeks to do is punish the Cuban government, and it does so in a number of ways. The most effective way is to have a chilling effect, as Rolando just said, on investments in Cuba and deals with Cuba, because if you're going to deal with Cuba, one of the things you need to think about is there is an inchoate claim potentially floating out there that at any time the President of the United States can authorize under Title III 
of Helms Burton. And under Title IV, if you are somebody like Sherry, you can be excluded from the United States. You cannot come visit with your family because you're using the MOA mining company's uh, assets in, in Cuba. So those were some of the mixed reasons for having Helms Burton, and that is why Helms Burton sometimes is so difficult to understand, difficult to rescind, and difficult overall to manage as a tool of policy for the United States. It's a fairly rigid structure, and that's why you hear all the conversation about lifting the embargo by having congressional action. I will tell you later on in the presentation what the conditions would be that are included within the context of Helms Burton to lift the embargo, and it sets a set of conditions for the Cuban government to meet. They're extremely difficult for the Cuban government to meet, so therefore the only solution to Helms Burton would be a full-out repeal by Congress. Okay. So, among the punitive measures enacted in Helms Burton is the absolute prohibition and the entry of or dealings outside the United States in merchandise that is of Cuban origin, has been transported through Cuba, or is made in whole or in part from an article which is the growth, produce, or manufacture of Cuba. In Cuban Spanish, Niun Piruli. Nothing that has touched Cuba, has been grown in Cuba, or comes from Cuba, can be brought in under Helms Burton. It is interesting to note that one of the regulations enacted under the Export Administration rules, under the Obama initiative, was that some items that were produced by independent entrepreneurs could be brought in, and I wonder that has never been put to the test except for one occasion, which is Marabu Po, and I wonder how that could be squared away with the language of Helms Burton. I didn't represent the importers of Marabu Coal, so I, I'm not going to opine on that. Within the other key definitions in section 623 of Helms Burton is a definition of what is, who constitutes a U.S. national. One of them is any United States citizen, any other legal entity organized under the laws of the United States. So, in theory, all of us who are Cuban Americans are, by definition, a U.S. national, but in a moment you will see how that gets distinguished when we come to the issue of claims. The definition of trafficking is a particularly broad definition. It says, a person traffics in confiscated property if that person knowingly sells, transfers, distributes, dispenses, brokers, manages, or otherwise disposes purchases, leases, receives, possesses, obtains control of, or otherwise acquires direct or indirect control of a confiscated property. That is a very, very broad, comprehensive definition of what trafficking is. However, and here we begin to look at the intricacies of the sausage, the term traffic does not include the delivery of international telecommunication signals to Cuba, so I guess my iPhone is okay to be used with the signal from AT&T. The trading or holding of securities publicly traded or held, unless the trading is with or by a person determined by the Secretary of Treasury to be a specially designated national. Transactions and uses of property incident to lawful travel to Cuba, to the extent that such transactions and uses of property are necessary to the conduct of such travel. Let's stop there for a minute and talk about a hypothetical. Recently there was an article about a family, a Cuban-American family, an individual that came forth and said, my family used to own Jose Martí International. So the question becomes, would that person, would those heirs, would the, the entities that those heirs own, have a claim theoretically under Helms Burton? And the point here would be that transactions and uses of property incident to lawful travel are not deemed to be trafficking. So I read that to mean that those of, of, of us who have gone back to Cuba, when we go through Jose Mati International Airport and we pay whatever airport fee, which I think is $25 or whatever it is, are not theoretically violating Helms Burton because it is incidental to lawful travel under, uh, under, under the regs, and therefore that person or those entities would not have a cost of action against us. 
Transactions and uses of property by a person who is both a citizen of Cuba and a resident of Cuba and who is not an official of the Cuban government or the ruling political party of Cuba. And that one brings to mind repatriación. And many of us have heard the stories, and some of us have in our families, persons who have gone back to Cuba and taken advantage of this process called repatriación, whereby you go back, you make a certain declaration, you fill out certain forms, and you commit to going back to Cuba once every two years, and you are allowed under Cuban law to own two pieces of property in Cuba, one in an urban area, one a vacation home. You can own a car, you can have certain personal property and so forth. You can avail yourself of the healthcare system, and you can even have a tarjeta de razonamiento if you are so inclined. That's called repatriación. So I think that this provision basically covers people who, in their wisdom, have decided to go back to live in Cuba and who buy a property back there. The term property is also very, very expansively defined. It includes patents, copyrights, trademarks, or any other form of intellectual property, whether real, personal, mixed, any present, future, or contingent right, security, or other interests therein, including leasehold interest. For purposes of Title III, and here we go again with the carve-outs, the term property does not include real property used for residential purposes, does not include real property used for residential purposes. I make emphasis on that. That means that our beautiful homes in Miramar or Vedado would theoretically not be included unless the claim to the property is held by United States nationals. So now you have a claimant who has a higher level and the claim has been certified under Title V, which means that you have to be a US national at the time of the certification or property is occupied by an official of the Cuban government or the ruling, uh, ruling political party in Cuba. So I have this client who has, of course, a license to do what he does in Cuba and so on and so forth. And he comes to see me a few years ago and he says, Pedro, you know, I, uh, I met this really nice Guajiro type. You know, he is a senior guy in the Cuban government, but a very nice guy. And he does agriculture, very nice guy. And, uh, you know, he met me and he was very nice. And so I said, oh, that's nice, very nice. And he says, and you know, his name is Mongo Castro. Mongo Castro was Fidel Castro's older brother. He's gone off to that great uh, party meeting in the sky by now uh, with his brother. So I, I, and he says, oh, okay. I say, oh, okay, fine. He says, and he has this very nice office in Miramar. I go, really? My, my ears perked up. And I said, where in Miramar? He says, Septima Avenida entre 30 y 32. And I go, wait a minute, hold on. Is that a two-story house? He goes, yes. I said, does it have four columns in the front in the home? He goes, yes. I said, okay. That's my grandfather's house. That's where I was born. So please tell him that I would like to have it back. So he comes back a couple of weeks later. He says, oye, Pedro, very nice. Momo was very nice. He was really nice. He said that anytime you're in Havana, you can use an office. And I said, look, let, I have a personal message for Momo. And then I started to tell what he could do the office and, and everything else, and I won't share it with the group because there are ladies present and so forth. But I use that as an example of perhaps under Health Burton, I could claim for that because my family residences, which is a group of four houses in Miramar, which, by the way, were not anywhere near as big or as sumptuous as I remembered as an 11-year-old. As an 11-year-old, I remember an enormous mansion, and I gotta tell you, our little house in Kendall is much nicer. Than, than my four, you know, my beautiful homework where my grandfather uh, built and so on and so forth. But I wonder if I could have a claim under Hans Burke. We'll see. Um, moving right along. The protection to U.S. nationals under Section 6082A is any person who traffics in property which was confiscated by the Cuban government on or after January 1, 1959. And you heard from Rolando, and I agree with him, that confiscation is very broadly defined under U.S. law. It's not the same as confiscation on Cuban law. Shall be liable to any U.S. national who owns the claim to such property for money damages in an amount equal to the amount greater of the amount certified by the Foreign Claim Settlement Commission. And you saw that certification, and you heard about the process. The amount certified under Section 6083A2 of this title, i.e. Helms Burton, or the fair market value of the property. Which begs the question, what, for example, would be the fair market value of my beautiful family heirloom home in Miramar at this point, considering the limited market that there is in Havana? I don't know. But I will tell you something about the real estate market in Cuba. 
Under U.S. law, Cuban Americans cannot own a home in Cuba unless you get a license from the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Period. Full stop. That's the way it is. Under Cuban law, a Cuban American, a Cuban born person cannot own property in Cuba unless he is repatriado. At which point you will be okay under Cuban law? Yes. That you can do. That you can do because you have it. Then, then you're okay. But under U.S. law, you already had it, so you don't need to ask for permission. But if you were want to do it, you would need to have permission. So there's a dichotomy there. Uh, but in the fair market value, here's what is happening. We all know it's a dirty little secret in Miami that a lot of people are going back to Cuba and buying property. And the buying of that property, and the Spaniards are doing it, and, and other folks are doing it, is you get un primo to buy the property, put it in their name, and you know that that's the deal. And primo will hold it for you, and someday in the future you'll go back and you say, primo, la casa es mía. Right? And then Primo will give it to you, or Primo won't give it to you. And if you go to a Cuban court, they'll go, ¿De qué tú estás hablando, mi hermano? O sea, uh, I'm not advising you to do it. It's a bad idea. It's a really bad idea to do that. Right? So that, that. That's how you do it. But because of that activity, the market value of property in Cuba has been going up. And prior to December of 2014, you could get a halfway decent house in Luyano, Vedado, Loco, whatever, for a thousand bucks, seven thousand bucks, ten thousand bucks. It had a hole in the roof, and no air conditioning, and so forth, but it wasn't a house. Uh, two months ago, someone that I know who is a resident manager for a Spanish company in Havana told me that he had bought a house next to the Amendares River, the Repatro Cori, which is a nice neighborhood, for two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand. Now we're talking Hialeah values. You know, we're, we're moving up the food chain. But it still begs the question, how do you value property in a place where there is no free market to speak of? Now, here is where Helms Burton becomes the Cuban American Attorney Full Employment Act of 2017. Uh, court costs and reasonable attorney's fees. If the claimant provides notice to a person against whom the actions can be started at least 30 days in advance of initiating the case, and the notified person continues to traffic, damages will be three times the amount under 1A, 2A, and what I missed there is you also get attorney's fees. So you could just see the stampede to the courthouse if Title III ever gets authorized, but here comes the clincher, ladies and gentlemen. The president may suspend the effective date of Title III for a period of six months. And President Clinton suspended it, and President Bush suspended it, and President Obama suspended it, and yes, our great president suspended it also because it was in the best interest of the United States. He did this last week. Okay, so even Trump, my God, even Trump suspended Title III because Title III really unleashes a storm of collateral issues for the United States. And that's likely to go on. Now, treatment of certain actions in the case of a United States national who was eligible to file a claim under the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission under Title V, but did not so file the claim, that United States national may not bring an action under that claim under this section. So what that basically says is, if you miss the boat, there is no other boat as a U.S. claimant. Not as, not, not as a U.S. national claimant, but as a U.S. claimant. A United States national, other than a United States national bringing an action under the section on a certified claim, may not bring the action on a claim under the section before the end of the two-year period beginning. That was just a savings clause to prevent uh, stale claims coming forth. But it also denotes that there is a distinction within Helms Burton for U.S. nationals who are certified claimants and people like us who are U.S. citizens but are not certified claimant holders. Now comes the part about the inapplicability of the Act of State Doctrine and Rolando alluded to it and it's important to note the importance of this. 
No court of the United States shall decline based upon the act of state doctrine to make a determination on the merits of the action or an action brought under paragraph one. And the reason for that is that notwithstanding, this is a conversation that Orlando and I have had over lunch any number of times, notwithstanding the string of cases on this issue, um, it is not altogether clear that actions for claims on human uh, property would be barred by the act of state doctrine. And the act of state doctrine is basically an a, a, a doctrine that states that no U.S. court shall take knowledge or take action or take jurisdiction of the actions that were taken by another sovereign state within their, their national borders, because to do so basically, number one, opens the United States to the same issue overseas, i.e. the courts of England or France or Russia would be taking issue with the actions that we take, and number two, it's just bad policy to do so. Which does not preclude the second part of, of this issue that I wanted to talk about, and maybe Orlando and I can have a conversation and there will be some questions on this, which is the concept of um, claiming property by the sovereign. It is a well-recognized right of a sovereign to take property subject to fair compensation. And in the United States, we call that concept, more than anything else, eminent domain. It is well known, well understood, and well recognized that the sovereign may take property. I think the issue with Cuban claims, I think, the, fun the fundamental issue is not that the Cuban government didn't have the right to take property, it's that the Cuban government never fairly compensated for that property. I think that's an important distinction to make. The other point I wanted to make is, if there is, an, and I get Rolando alluded to this, if you are going to take one of your potential claims on Cuba, any interest in Cuba, any property in which Cuba or a Cuban national has an interest, and you're going to assign it, sell it, or transfer it in the United States, you need a license from the Office of Foreign Assets Control. That you, you need to have. And they have, they have some guidance on that in their website. However, Helms Burton says, Notwithstanding any other provision of law and for purposes of this subchapter only, any claim against the Cuban government shall not be deemed to be an interest in property, the transfer of which to a United States national required before March 1996 or required after March 12, 1996, a license issued by or the permission of any agency, property a claim to which is owned by a U.S. national, traffics in confiscated property a claim to which is owned by a U.S. national, or as a corporate officer, principal, or shareholder with a controlling interest, in an entity that's been involved in trafficking, and boy, we really go after them, and is a spouse, minor child, or agent or su of such a person. And this provision has been used, and I use the primary example, which is the Canadian mining company, Sherry. So, how does Hell Burton, how does the embargo begin to be lifted? And there are other actions I need to do. Well, the first thing that happens uh, under Title II of Helms Burton, there are certain criteria that are explicit as to what constitutes first a Cuban transition government and second a Cuban democratically elected government. And basically, is that Cuba becomes almost like Switzerland because Cuba, which is difficult, um, the transitional government is a government that has legalized all political activity, released all political prisoners, and allowed for the inspection of jails. Good luck with that has dissolved the Department of State Security Committees of the Defense of the Revolution and Rapid Response Brigades, has made a public commitment to free and fair elections within 18 months, has ceased interference with radio and TV Mati, makes public commitment and demonstrable progress in establishing an independent judiciary, respecting human rights, allowing the establishment of independent trade unions, and here's the one piece of good news, I think we're halfway through complying with this one. Does not include Fidel or Raul Castro, so I think we got one, one of them we got. One of them we got. The second one is going to leave his position as president in about a year, less than a year now, but he will remain as first secretary of the Communist Party, which is really the power behind the throne, so query does that constitute the government or not, and has given assurance that it will allow a speedy and efficient distribution of assistance to the Cuban people, yada, yada, yada. Democratically elected government, the second tier is which, in addition to meeting those requirements, results from free and, free and fair elections, shows a respect for basic civil liberties and human rights, 
substantially moving towards a market-oriented economy. You can say that there's a little bit of movement on that. It's committed to making constitutional changes to ensure free and fair elections and rights. And made demonstrable progress in establishing an independent judiciary. And here's the clincher. Has made demonstrable progress towards returning confiscated property to U.S. citizens or providing full compensation for such property in accordance with standards of international law. And this circles back to what Rolando was saying earlier that as a conceptual issue, this settlement of claims becomes sort of the, the angular stone of a true, full restoration of diplomatic relations with Cuba. That's how the whole thing started. And I, I would propose to you that that is probably how the whole thing ends. Um, evidence of ownership, I think it's interesting to note that in any action brought into the subchapter, the court accepts as conclusive a proof of ownership of an interest in property, a certification of a claim. So throughout all of Helm's burden, and this is an important point, you see this coda that enforces and reaffirms and reinforces that people with certified claims are first in line and they have all the rights and they have priority of claim and they have a presumption that their claim is uh, has been properly valued. Um, if in an action under the subchapter a claim has not been so certified, the court may appoint a special master, and such determinations are for evidentiary purposes only. Um, we waive uh, the effect of determination of foreign of international entities. If a foreign entity is the one that determined the value, it's not going to be binding on us. Uh, rule of construction. Uh, this is important to note for Cuban Americans. Nothing in this chapter in Section 514 of the International Claims Settlement Act of 1949, as added in subsection B, shall be construed to require or otherwise authorize the claims of Cuban nationals who became United States citizens after their property was confiscated to be included in the claims certified to the Secretary of State by the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission for the purposes of foreign nego uh, future negotiation or a spousal of claims with a friendly government in Cuba when diplomatic relations are restored or a superseding amending or otherwise altering certifications made under Title V of international claims. So, the notification there is, so we're on our own. We're going to have to go deal with whatever Cuban government is there and knock on their door and say, hey, look, you know, you took away my property, the Cuban government did, it was never uh, paid for, never so what are we going to do? So, Good luck with that. So, political issues. In any of these negotiations, the United States is going to continue to pursue its policy interests in the region, which are stability, immigration, trade, national security, and drug trafficking. As Rolando said, it's going to be very important to deal with, and this is why it's important to continue the engagement process with competing claims on existing investments from Spain, Mexico, Venezuela, and Russia. Any reformed Cuban government is going to be concerned with consolidating power, with establishing legitimacy, with getting international uh, recognition, with reassuring its constituency, with ensuring economic progress, with guaranteeing health and education, generating goodwill, and having access to financing. And the key to all of this is a balance of equity, justice, and practice. And, and for Cubans, for those of us who were born in Cuba, we have always been primarily focused on the justice issue of this because we feel, and I think justifiably so, that this government, in a very unjust and unfair way, took away our legacy, they took away our birthright. We are seeking justice. Cuban Americans seek justice. They seek a way to, 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 to bring healing to that and to find a way for that wrong to be righted. But in all of that, there needs to be a measure of pragmatism because at the end of the day, Cuba is bankrupt. Cuba has not found a vast wealth of oil. The country needs a massive amount of investment, and it is impractical. And, and frankly, from my point of view, this is just my own little personal point of view, that I, I, I cannot find a way to say I need to be repaid from my grandfather's house down to the last penny. I am perfectly happy in Kenya. Now, where do we go from here? Well. 
how is this going to be fixed? How, how does this end? It could end with, we're all going to hold hands and say kumbaya, and all will be fixed with negotiation. We could have Cuba become a little China in the Caribbean and really evolve to have this primarily state-driven economy, but it becomes a, a, a country full of energy and drive and, and the economy takes off. We could have it devolve into a Syria within 90 miles from the Caribbean if the Cuban government doesn't address their structural problems and their political problems. The other thing that could happen, and this is quite frankly what I'm seeing happening in Cuba right now, is a successful rearranging of the deck chairs in the Titanic. Uh, you know, the Cuban government is going through all the motions of doing all these things, but literally and figuratively, the island is sinking under the waves. And unless they get with the pro program, it will sink under the waves. And then they face a new policy, the new policy of the Trump administration, which I call the policy of hostile neglect. And uh, we just had our wonderful ambassador designate Jeff Laurentis and his stint in Cuba. He's gone. We now have a charge d'affaires. And quite frankly, given the current situation in D.C., I don't see Cuba as being a top priority for this administration anytime soon. Notwithstanding that, not to worry, all will be well because, let me tell you why, it will be terrific. I have the mooch taking care of everything. Thank you very much. to believe, and it is politically impractical to assume 
that two million Cuban Americans, who, who by now, many of them have passed away, uh, you know, their parents have passed away who really own the houses. So it's us who are the heirs and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We'll go back and now the Cuban government's gonna say, okay, you leave the house, now uh, the pedrazas, you know, the second, third generation pedrazas will now have the house. And what do you do with that Cuban family? What does that do for Cuba? So I think that the problem of claims, and particularly residential claims, is, is one that needs to be weighed with the eyes of justice, but also with the eyes of equity, and, and frankly, with the eyes of compassion. And understanding that, thank God, we landed here in this magnificent country. We have built wonderful lives. We've been, by and large, tremendously successful. And, and quite frankly, I see it, and I don't want to be modeling about it, but I think my role and, and our role is to help. I'm not there to impose a burden on those poor people. I, I, my heart breaks every time I go. My wife who's sitting in the audience trying to hide. Uh, every time I come back from Cuba, says she needs to give me three days of therapy because I'm so emotionally abroad. But I, but I think our task is to help, not to. Not to All right. Uh, <coughs> Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right, I'll speak a little louder in the case. So I was in Havana in 97 to 99 in the embassy. And then in 2006, I chaired or directed the work of the economic sector part of the uh, CAPSI 2 exercise. This is the exercise in which we, were, we talked about how to uh, provide assistance to a free Cuba. This was specifically entitled how you do it under the conditions of Halbert, which of course made it virtually impossible. Um, but we struggled for months and we came up with some ideas. It's an interesting document to read, but you have to go in. You gotta skip chapters to put it all together, please. But one thing that was, and this is commentary, one thing that was particularly interesting is we had just gone through the whole Nicaraguan experience. Nicaraguan confiscated property experience was one on for a decade or more, where in Nicaragua the same people who wrote Helms Burton had insisted that, that Nicaraguan nationals who were not US citizens at the time be compensated. And uh, of course it made an immense problems in Nicaragua because you for 20 years you had no clarity of title for properties. We wanted to avoid that, and so we wrote into the CASI 2 language the, the comments that, in fact, we would not advocate for Cuban nationals who were not U.S. citizens at the time. As for Helms Burton Law, but certainly when you're dealing with Helms people who are running the Latin American Bureau of the Department of State, we very clear to assume that that was going to back to the case. And so we ended up saying um, that while the U.S. government would not push for that compensation, we hoped that in the, in the act of reconciliation, uh, the Cuban people would do something when the time came. So um, and, and what we hoped was, and if we did, we neutralized these helpless people who so I'm not well, thank comment, you. I just going to tell you a little bit of history. Very interesting insight. Thank you. A couple of questions, please. Uh, number one, when you stated that uh, nationalized U.S. property was never fairly compensated. Now, at the end of this thing, you said, at the early stages of those nationalizations, the Cuban government was prepared to compensate. Actually, this legislation, Cuban legislation, making clear the terms of that compensation based on the assumption that United States and Cuban relations would continue to evolve normally, and that the sugar quota would remain in place. 
my understanding and documents that I remember seeing at some point indicate that the Eisenhower administration was very clear and was very adamant in preventing U.S. companies from negotiating any kind of settlement with the Cuban government concerning compensation. That's one thing. The other thing, at the very end of your presentation, you said that you seek justice to what was taken away from us, meaning essentially Cuban national. Now, to my understanding, these most Cuban matters that are mentioned and talked about, what they did was to abandon their country. They were not evicted. They were not forced to abandon the country. And if I remember correctly, most of them abandoned the country under the firm belief that in a very, very short period of time, they would return okay, right after the successful landing of the U.S. Marines or something like that. And if this is the case, what kind of arrangement can there be in terms of compensation, equity, this or that? And in addition, please think of the consequences. Think of the consequences, the implications of alienating, alienating a lot of people in Cuba that will not buy into the idea of a deal that implies some kind of question to what was legitimately given then. Thank you for your questions, and I don't know if you listened carefully to the answer I gave to Silvia Carraza, which is that I don't think it is our role to go back and evict uh, Cubans so that we can have a property that belonged to my grandfather. That having been said, and with all due respect, I need to speak up for Cuban Americans. Uh, number one, there were many people whose property, their businesses that they had built with a lifelong effort were expropriated without compensation. There were people who had farms that were very productive that were nationalized without compensation. No, that's not because they abandoned them. It's because somebody showed up and said, here's a decree, get out, or uh, you know, you're going to go to jail. Uh, number two, what constitutes abandonment is, is a term that you and I can have a long conversation about. Because while it is true that my family left voluntarily, my father represented U.S. corporations, and it was made very clear to him that he was in jeopardy personally, and so was his family if he didn't leave. So, uh, you know, what, what constitutes abandoning the country is, is a debatable point. And finally, upon the return on, on the wings of the Marines, um, the, the attempt by Cuban Americans to go back uh, was not made with the Marines. It was made by a landing force of Cuban Americans. 1,200 Cuban Americans who went to the beach, got abandoned in the beach by their ally, and paid their price in death and in prison, and that's the way it was. And we lost the Civil War. I always say it. We're the South, uh, you know, the Cubans are the North. We lost the Civil War. It was a Civil War. So I, I, I'm going to take, uh, with all due respect, issue with you on, on the matter of abandonment. But I will agree with you 100% that. It is not our role to demand absolute and perfect justice, which doesn't exist in this world to begin with, at the price of risking a future political process, which is why I think this exercise that we're having here, while it is useful and interesting and more amusing than a White House press conference, is fundamentally academic, because the solution to this problem is the future of Cuba, and it's a political solution where Cuban Americans help build Cuba and not detract from I just wanted to make a quick comment on that. A um, couple of things. Uh, you abandoned the country. You abandoned.
land on the country and they apply the same law that they apply in 1961 to you and to me, and to all of the people that left the country uh, without returning at a certain point in time or paying Cuba's uh, extension of visa or you name it. So basically, you know, they apply the same law. That law just changed recently with the new uh, immigration law that allowed the 24 months for the people to keep the property in Cuba. So basically, anybody that just still today leave the country, did not return, or whatever is considered abandoned. But not only that, that particular law also uh, eliminated all the inherited rights that your children and grandchildren may have in Cuba one day. That particular law also uh, uh, eliminate your parental rights of any children that you left in Cuba. So uh, it is a combination of both. But going back to Joshua, as I mentioned before, any residential property in Cuba today is protected by Cuban law. So basically, any person that had good title in Cuba today is the owner of the property and nobody will take them from those properties. But Cuban law, and by the Health Board of Law, it's very clear that residential properties are not included in the law. So Cuban national, Cuban national, or US national, Cuban national do not have any protection on the Health Board. I think we want to make sure that Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you left, both of you left me reading this morning with all your presentations. I'm still trying to recover from all of the legalese. Um, I, I think that going back 20 years ago, I remember at one of our first ASCII meetings here in Miami discussing precisely this same problem. How do we compensate individuals for properties that were uh, confiscated by the government, and how do we go about the privatization of state-owned enterprises and state-owned assets in Cuba in a future government? At that time, we took a very hard look at what had happened in Eastern Europe, and we had a lot of models to look at, models in East Germany, in uh, Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in many other countries. And the conclusion was that all of these models, to a large extent, were faulty had significant problems with them in terms of either the equity solutions that they provided or more importantly, the inability to provide a quick solution to the issues and therefore get properties back into the economic production. So what we concluded at the time, and there were several of us there, Luis Ruiz was sitting in the back of the room, was one of the panelists, I was another one, there were others too. Our conclusion was that there are two overwhelming principles that we need to abide in any future solution, and I would be interested in your reaction. The first principle is the principle of efficiency. We need to get those properties, whether they be farms, factories, residence, whatever, clear legal title and get them back into productive use as quickly as possible. The country is going to need those assets back in production. So an efficiency, an efficient solution would put those assets back to work as quickly as possible by removing legal uncertainty. So that's the first principle. The second principle is one of equity. We need to compensate those people who lost their assets through illegal expropriation and do so in a reasonable way, taking into account the, you know, the, the, the passage of time, the interest involved, and there will also be, obviously, depreciation and other settlements that can happen that would reduce some of these claims. So we have two principles that are not necessarily coexisting and that could be in conflict with one another. So therefore, we cannot resolve them through one process. We need two different processes. So what we proposed back in 20 years ago was that in a future arrangement, and I don't know about the legal foundations of this, but what we conceived was that there would have to be two tribunals. There would be one tribunal with, where 
properties owned by the state would be sold to the highest bidder with clear title and immediate effectiveness and put those properties back to use. And I don't care who owned them, your grandfather, mine, or, any, or an American corporation, whatever the case may be, those properties will be put back into productive use right away by being sold in the first tribunal. It's sold against either currency exchange or against Cuban bonds, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And then there would be a second tribunal where people with claims would come to establish their claims, and they would be compensated based on some method of analysis and evaluation, and that they would be compensated and paid in bonds, new bonds, and those bonds could be either used in the first tribunal to buy assets or sold in a secondary market that would be created where you could have maybe at a discount get rid of them and cash them for so in, in this sense you would create a dual track solution that would provide for efficiency by getting assets back into play right away and by equity by recognizing the losses that people incur over time now i don't know if this is uh, so dreaming but we thought at the time that that solution was infinitely superior to anything we saw in Eastern Europe. So your comments will be valuable. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up. I just got the signal that we're out of time. But to briefly address, I think the point that you made is a very valid one, that at the end of the day, and it's something that I keep coming back to, this needs to be solved politically in Cuba by Cubans. That's the only way forward. And I think one of the critical mistakes, I mean, I recognize that I understand that the rights of, Q, of American nationals and American companies that got expropriated in 6061 needs to be espoused by the U.S. government. The truth of the matter is, uh, just between us chickens here, that those losses were written off 50 years ago, and, and the general scheme of things in the U.S. economy, they're peanuts. They're really peanuts. It's not that much. So that's, that, I think, is a fairly solvable problem. Our problem, the problema cubano, it's a problem within Cuba, de los cubanos. And that is why we need to engage, and that is why we need to sit with the Cuban government as unsavory as we may find it, in order to seek that solution. But I think you presented a good one. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your help. Thank you.